Joining us today on the Everyman Podcast is Dr. Helena Gazelka from the Mayo Clinic. In addition to being an anesthesiologist with a focus on pain medicine, Dr. Gazelka is also a podcaster. She hosts the Mayo Clinic Q&A Podcast, which is available everywhere that you guys are listening to this podcast. So we're here today to do a little Mayo Clinic Edition Swapcast. Dr. Gazelka, how you doing, miss? Woohoo! Hi, I'm doing yeah. great. Thanks for having me here. Oh, it's a, it's it's an honor to Love have it. you. We, we're really excited about this. And uh, before we we get too far into it, I just kind of want to set the the table here for how this wonderful experience came to be. Um, I had a a really big surgery at the Mayo Clinic back in 2012 uh, called a transapical myectomy. It's an open heart surgery, and someday we'll talk in depth about that. But that's a whole nother podcast. The whole we're going to do that on my podcast. Justin. Oh yeah, that's right. It's going to be a whole nother podcast over at the Mayo Clinic. So, um, and and I met a wonderful uh, gal. Shout out to Tracy Klein uh, in the uh, marketing and media department, and she reached out to me recently um, and said, uh, "Hey, you know, instead of me pitching her ideas because we did some things together in the past, she's like, I got an idea for you this time. How about we do a little podcast?" And I said, "Look, let's let's do it." Short answer, yes. And then I proceeded to hit her with a wall of text. It's kind of my, my style. I, I get a little excited when I <laughs> get creative. So um, Dr. Gazelka, what's up? What are you doing? Where are you? What's going on? Well, thanks for having me, guys. I am in Minnesota, lovely Minnesota. We have Beautiful. plenty of snow here right now. Um, I work at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. We have three locations, uh, main locations in Arizona, Florida, and uh, Rochester. And I happen to be here in the homeland. That's, that's, that's the, like the uh, the home team, right? That's Rochester. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll tell you, I've been, um, you know, my family's from Pittsburgh, and I always used to hear stories about how, how awful cold Pittsburgh is. And then I you know, spent a whole season of Steelers games out in the cold in Pittsburgh, and I was like, holy shit, this is pretty cold. And then I had open heart surgery in January in oh, Minnesota. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, nope, this is cold. <laughs> this is it. And like, uh, like, as and as sick as I was, I still remember like getting into that car that morning, being like, "God, who does this?" You know, and it's like three feet of snow. It's just I don't know how you I don't know how you handle the cold. It's true. You almost can't describe it. It's really fascinating because we have all kinds of people come from all around the world, not only to get medical care but also to train at Mayo Clinic to go to school and be trained as residents and fellows and scientists, and they are appalled by how cold it is. I grew up in Northern Minnesota on a farm. So I was used to waiting for the school bus when it was 30 below. Oh and, um, to, yeah, you just, yeah, I go from my heated house to my heated garage, to my heated car, right into the subway to walk into work. So I'm never <laughs> outside. That's, I guess wow. that's the trick. And that was the cool thing in, in Rochester was there was tunnels everywhere, Daryl. Yeah. So like the, the hotel connected to, and the whole town is kind of built around the Mayo Clinic. So it was like its own little, it almost felt like a like a, like going to Penn State or something like some little college town kind of vibe. Dude, and, she had me at thirty below. That's crazy. Oh, it was insane. <laughs> I'm from Chicago, was, so I don't know if it gets that cold. Well, sometimes, but not that cold. It's it's, it's yeah. But the the you know you can go to the mall under under the ground, back to your hotel. It's all it's all very cool. So mm. now I mentioned that you are an anesthesiologist. So yeah. you know what exactly is an anesthesiologist for us? Uh, you know, simple musicians here. Well, so I'm a physician who puts people to sleep and cares for them uh, throughout their surgical um, experience. We take care of patients preoperatively in the operating room uh, while they're asleep and having surgery in procedure areas. And also a lot of um, anesthesiologists are ICU doctors. I happen to be a pain specialist. So we also take care of patients who have um, pain of all sorts related to surgeries, injuries, chronic pain, the whole gamut. Wow. Now, how did you get into that focus? Because I, I, you know, I've, I've always found it interesting how doctors choose, you know, their fields. And it's like, at some point, somebody's like, you know what, I'm a foot guy, I'm gonna go do feet, I'm gonna do, you know, throat and like, <laughs> it, like so, you know, it just, it's like, is it a dartboard thing? Like, did you know that anesthesia, like that, that was your thing, you wanted to get into it? Or did you find that like along your along your journey there? Justin, how many hours do you have for me to explain this? To oh, you? my God. <laughs> Let's all go. All the way back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, literally, I decided I was going to be a physician when I was 10 years old. I wow. thought that all women were either nurses or teachers. And then I found a book in the school library. It was a tiny school in Akeley, Minnesota. And I found a book where there's a woman who was a physician. And I was like, well, I'm not, I'm going to be the doctor then. Never changed my mind. But I had a kind of a circuitous route, had kids early 
went to be a physician assistant first and um, so went to medical school and I love patient interactions, but I also love procedures. And I really liked the idea, honestly, of being replaceable. So there are very few careers where someone can step in and take over your shift. Emergency medicine is one and anesthesia is one. And that really appealed to me. Now I work in a group practice at Mayo and pain medicine isn't really like that. I follow all my old, own patients and I love it, but we do cover for each other. And, um, you know, surgeons, it's different. Uh, you obviously know surgeons at Mayo Clinic and they're very tied to their patients. And, and um, of course they do have others cover their call for them at times, but um, it's a little different experience. But that's kind of how I got here, but I just, I love it. I love um, everything about people. And so I practice both pain and palliative medicine as well. Now, when you're, you know, in the surgical, op, you know, space, now this is interesting because we've never had anybody on the show that, uh, you know, is, is in there from that perspective. And you're kind of, you're obviously, you're doing your part, keeping the patient alive, but you're also kind of witnessing this whole like I, to me, it's almost like a performance because it's choreographed and everyone has a role to fill and they're all working collaboratively and together to do like a common thing. So it's, it's like anytime we talk about a football team or a band or anything like that. And you're kind of one of the few people in there from my perspective, that's like, I can kind of relate it to being the drummer where you're kind of keeping the pace, if you will, of the whole operation. Cause like, if you step out of that line it's over and you know you've got a, a unique position in that how does that how do you how, how did you get your mind into that space and to be able to like not only do it every day but you know because there's obviously ups and downs with that yeah. you know with, with operating so how did you kind of get yourself mentally to be able to do that it is a really, it is a really unique experience. It's wonderful. It's a team, obviously a team effort. You don't practice anesthesia by yourself. Now pain medicine, you can have a practice where you do interventional procedures, et cetera. And that's what I do now. But when I was doing OR anesthesia and um, training as an anesthesiologist, um, I remember my advisor in medical school at the University of Minnesota said, Helena, why would you waste your personality on people who are asleep? <laughs> you like talking to people. And I said, yes, but yeah. where in the world do you have to build rapport quicker than when yeah. you're an anesthesiologist? You literally have to go in to pre-op right before someone's about to, you know, put their life in a surgeon's mm -hmm. hands and in your hands and convince yeah. them that you're the person to do that. And it's really amazing. Um, it's an amazing privilege to travel with patients through that journey and to be part of that choreograph in the operating room. It really is. A, it's a really unique experience. I guess that doesn't get old either from like an adrenaline no. perspective either. Cause like, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing else you can do in your daily life. That's going to equal that level of focus. And, uh, I don't want to say risk, but, uh, consequence, you know, you have, you do have to have the right personality, uh, for it. Do they, it's someone who reacts quickly in emergencies and doesn't mind doing that. So it's not the career for everyone because there's a little mantra about anesthesia that it can be, you know, hours of boring for, um, or, or stable for, yeah. <laughs> for a few minutes of absolute terror. And you have to prepare yourself and know you don't have, to, almost don't have time to think. You almost have to just know how to act in the moment. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a neat career though. It's like that guy that's watching the nuclear radar, you know, it's just like most of the time he's just eating popcorn chicken, hanging out. And then it's like, well, well, we got a little bleep here. <laughs> Let's go. Let's look, yeah. Oh man, that's yeah. That's that's something that uh, I find really interesting. And, and in my various, you know, I've I've only been completely under one time, and I know Daryl mm -hmm. Daryl has too. And we've both talked about our our experiences and how, you know, we, we both ha had some interesting experiences during that. That it took us a while to figure it out. Um, but there's also been times where I was. I guess what's the difference between being like out where you can like literally cut me open versus like uh, when I had my ICD, my, my defibrillator implanted yeah. where I was like talking to them if they wash their hands and asking them about, you know, the t I, I asked them while I was half under to take photos of, of it. And they're like, what? And I was like, can you just, and I, I recited my phone number. They texted them to me. I still have them <laughs> and, uh, because I figured like anytime I I'm opened up, I want to take a look under the hood, you know, like I, not right. everybody, yeah. not everybody gets that opportunity. So, um, that is a, that's a really good question. It's really confusing for patients because general anesthesia means 
you are asleep and we are breathing for you essentially. Mm -hmm. So there's off, there's a breathing tube that goes in or some other device. The patient is often paralyzed. So mm -hmm. they couldn't move if they were awake and wanted to, or couldn't breathe on their own. That allows for muscle relaxation for surgery to take place. That's a general anesthetic. And then uh, sedation or um, MAC anesthesia, we call it monitored anesthetic care. You can be lighter. So you, we can provide IV anesthetics to people where they receive medicine through an IV, but they're not necessarily all the way asleep. So you can give somebody Whoa. a spinal and numb them up from what? here down so you Dude, can operate so, on them. That is yeah. cool. <laughs> so crazy to me is yeah. like what you can what you can do to a person who's alive. It's amazing. With but like often, some you know, liquid. you hear these stories about people who have memories under anesthesia or I was <laughs> awake. Most of the time they did not have a general anesthetic. No, that's happened to a few unfortunate people and yeah. it is absolutely terrifying and yeah. horrible and causes PTSD and all kinds of things. But in typically that it, that feeling of twilight is when someone is using receiving a sedation type of anesthesia rather than a general anesthetic. Whoa. Wow. That's yeah, what, I, you're I, a I, Jedi. I, yeah, cool. that's, yeah, that's that's really that's really awesome. So so we've we've covered, you know, what what it is that you're doing, you know, and your your day to day. So how is it and again, you, you know, you talk about your personality and obviously it comes through when you listen to your show and, and just the first fifteen minutes here getting to getting to speak with you. But um how did you find your way, you know, into being the host of the Mayo Clinic Q and A podcast? And what is the Mayo Clinic Q and A podcast? I have no idea how I got here. That's a fascinating thing about life is how you just keep going along and um, things fall in your lap if they're the right thing for you. And if you're doing what you really love, you just find more things to do that you love. And that's kind of been my experience. So as I said, I did anesthesia, but now I do pain medicine, mostly interventional pain procedures and chronic pain management. So I see a lot of patients in the clinic, do a lot of um, x-ray guided procedures on people. And um, uh, in 2016, Mayo got, you know, understandably concerned about the opioid epidemic. And I'd had some experiences leading our inpatient pain service and things like that. And I kind of got to know some of the leadership at Mayo and was given this role of um, taking control of the opioid situation at Mayo and examining that and running our opioid stewardship program. And it's just kind of snowballed from there. I've just opportunities. The doors just open when you're open and available to them in life and you're excited and and um, uh, open to possibility. Uh, I'm the medical director for public affairs, uh, our public affairs department, uh, you know, does our internal and external communication uh, for Mayo. And so that led me to the opportunity to do the Q&A podcast. We had for about 30 years had a radio program uh, at Mayo. And then when COVID um, uh, happened almost exactly a year ago, right? Uh, there's a, we started reassessing is, who, how do we, what programs do we continue and what programs do we change? And we sort of had seen that there was a need for more social media type of interaction with our patients and with the community and with the public and decided to go in the direction of podcast rather than radio. And so, you know, obviously just like you guys do, we record it. And so people can just listen or they can look at the videos uh, depending on what they want. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, the whole intention of the podcast is to educate the public, to teach them about interesting um, things in medicine, to teach them about services that Mayo Clinic provides, to teach them about different disease states. Uh, we've done over 50 something programs on COVID uh, since it started. And uh, so, um, we've just, it's a gamut. We talk about cancer. We talk about heart disease. We talk about all kinds of things. So it's really fun. All the classics. All That's the classics. right. <laughs> all, <laughs> all the, the hits. Classics. Yeah. No. All the hits. Yeah. Yeah. And I find that really interesting because, um, you know, I obviously, again, you know, the, I would not be here if it, if it were not for the Mayo Clinic and a, and a whole host of other great medical professionals. Um, so I have always kept a close eye on what's going on there. And from time to time, they want to talk about my thing. And I'm like, yeah, sure, let's do it. You know, because I, you know, it's just, you know, it's what I'm into. So and I like I like the idea of being able to educate people. And I think about where I was when I was like a 15 year old with with this thing, this cloud hanging of uncertainty hanging over my head and, and not being able to find anyone that had weathered the whole storm that was like relatable, you know, so that was what motivated yeah. me to kind of put myself out there. And um, I think what the Mayo Clinic, you know, the, the Q and A podcast offers, you know, when I'm listening to it is it's like, you get to sit into a conversation 
you know, between uh, yourself and, and, and world-class specialists that are given good advice that, you know, um, you might not know that you, that you need, you know, I was listening to one about, you know, it was a cancer one actually. And just you're talking about wellness and, and health and your diet and all these things and, and how that can uh, impact your state. And yep. it's, um, you know, there's so many places to get information from. And, and one of the, the pillars of, of the Everyman podcast is, is positivity and shining our light. And we talk about shining our light. And what that means is, you know, using your strength, the thing that makes you positive, the thing that helps you in your state of being and, and aiming it outward and sharing it with other people. And, and just from, get, again, from getting to know you for a few minutes and, and listening to you on the podcast to see that's what you're able to do. And you, and clearly you must do that with your patients and, and you do it on the podcast. And it's uh it's really, it's a neat thing to see how all the dots kind of are connected together. I love that, Justin, yeah. because I think if there's anything that I go to work every day and want to offer patients, it's hope. There's always hope. Maybe it's not the hope that you're wishing for, but there's hope. And so to bring people, um, you know, we try to practice what we call evidence-based medicine at Mayo, which means there are scientific studies to back up what we do. And we know that it's the right treatment um, because it's been done over and over and proven that way. Not always possible, you know, sometimes it's, that's, that's not available, but um, we, pr we want to provide truth. And so we try to provide fact-based um, information that can be a trusted source of information to our patients and to the public. We don't want to just get on the latest, um, you know, craze that's going or the latest thing that buzz that's going on. We want to know what the actual facts are about that topic and present those so that people have good information and therefore have hope if they have that situation themselves. Yeah. I got, I got to just jump in real quick here because uh, it, it's, it's one thing to have truth but it's another thing to be personable. It's another thing to be, um, how can you say, have that fun spirit that you have, because that really brings people in. That really gives them that hope that you're, that you're, that you're talking about. And that really extends some, um, the life of that hope, extends the life, you know, just a, a, a number of different things. And I know, Brother Jay, you always talk about, you know, your, your the things that, we, that bind us together that we've had and experienced over time with respect to being in another hospital. But um, uh, it, it's the, the, the nurses, it's the doctors that, that provide what it is that you do, which is that fun spirit, that personal, that, that, that personal, personable nature that, um, you know, really makes those, cause it's a lonely time. Yeah. It really is a lonely time. And, when, and when, when, you, when, when you approach it like that, you know, it, it, you, when you're presented with, with, with hard truths and you have someone like you, you know, Dr. Gazelka, it, it really, it really makes the difference. Oh, well, that's kind of you. I have to say, I try to put myself, uh, one thing I've always said, we actually did a, a public television uh, document docu-series on opioids with the Minnesota Public Television. And what I told them was, I try to walk a mile in my patient's shoes. I try to think about what is it like to be this person coming to me scared and terrified? None of the knowledge that I have about you know, what's going to happen or why they're sitting waiting in this cold room by themselves or who's yeah. going to come in next or what's going to happen next or what that test means. And just think about what, what would a person need to know and how would I feel and how would I mm -hmm. want to be treated? And I think the staff at Mayo Clinic um, is amazing. Kudos to our nurses because they do most of the patient care, quite honestly. You know, we are physicians. We um, have some time, but the other staff interact so much, our desk attendants and our nurses and our respiratory therapists and our, our lab technicians and everyone who touches our patients, we hope is um, providing them with a positive experience. And we hear so much about that. So I'm glad that's, um, you know, that translates. Well, I got to say thank you to, to you and to the Mayo Clinic, because if it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't have my bro. That's right. So thank you, bro. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and we keep talking about hope and I, ha I have to, I have to say it's, we also have this saying called the cosmic canoe here and uh, you're in it now, you know, whether you want yep. to or not, you're grabbing or in the canoe. And, <laughs> and the idea is that everybody's kind of really connected uh, yeah. one way or another. And um, like Kevin Bacon. Exactly. And if you, if you, if you, yes, <laughs> yes. So, separation. That's yeah. right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, um, that network just keeps growing and growing and growing. And um, it's funny you mentioned that I, I had the opportunity again, you know, Tracy connected me with uh, a somebody in production at the Mayo Clinic that they were doing a video for the cardiac surgical team. Yeah. And uh, they had this whole thing 
shot at it. It was already shot, Daryl. I don't have to send you this. I don't think I've ever sent you this. Yeah, yeah, send it to me. And uh, they had the whole thing planned over, like, we need like this. It would just be like 90 seconds, do this, that. I mean, of course, I'm like, of course, I love to help. So me and the extractist boys, we put together a little piece of music and we called it hope. And I said, you know, this is what this means to me was the hope that they, they, and I explained it to them in in an email and they were like, oh man. And then that ended up being like the name of the commercial. And then they used it out there. So it's funny that, that you say that because it's, you know, that was the beacon, you know, when we, when my mother was searching and searching and searching for answers and came across, you know, a a video of somebody at the Mayo Clinic talking about, yeah, well, we have this, you know, procedure, it's experimental, you know, it's new, and we think it's a a game changer, you know, it can, it can help certain things. And I was like, hmm, you know, and then, you know, through shout out, Dr. Marty Marin was able to kind of connect the dots and get us in there. But you, you got that whole sense that like, oh, wait, there's, we're not like, and I was, I always explain to people because Mayo Clinic has a name recognition to people who like have no, like they can't name any other hospital other than their local one, but they might be able to say like, oh, they've heard the Mayo Clinic talking about some athlete or Oprah got her diabetes test there or something crazy, you know, I'll have to edit that out. Did she? No, I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah, allegedly. <laughs> um, and uh, so, uh, <laughs> but you, you know, it's not like a hospital you go into where you're like, hey, I'm here to, you know get my back checked out it's it's a clinic that that it's research driven and there's for lack of a better term there's shit happening there you know that's not happening everywhere else um and it's a special place and you're kind of seated like i said you're 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 in the mix with all that with with a lot of different characters and you know one of the things i was curious about was you know you've been doing this podcast now uh the mayo clinic q a podcast uh, available everywhere you know podcasts are available and on youtube Um, that's right Plug, 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 plug. Mm, mm, What mm, what is, uh, was there any specific guest or an episode you could point to that you're like, Hey, if I'm going to start checking this out and I, cause it's a lot of information. And if you just start in there and you're talking about, you know, inflammable bowel syndrome or something might throw you off and it might be not the thing you're looking for. What would be like something that stands out of a podcast that you've done that you really took something away from that you want to share with people? I mean, I guess I would say that the thing that has been the biggest for us right now, obviously, is COVID information. And so we have a um, a vaccine expert. In fact, he's the editor of Vaccine, and he's a consultant for many of the companies that have produced vaccines, but also um, is a Mayo Clinic um, physician, Greg Poland. And he and I kind of have a fun time doing a po- doing these podcasts together, and we do one a week. And then we try to do other topics as well. So if, you know, March is... Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to mess this up, but if it's some kind of, you know, kidney month or colorectal cancer month or cardiac month, we try to focus and do some things that are, um, that are topic related to that. But what you said about your mom searching, really, my, my heart just went out because I have thought that so many times, what a privileged situation I am in. You know, I had a brother have a ruptured, um, uh, an aortic dissection in Dallas, Texas, and he should have died. And somehow he made it to Baylor and, I had connections at Mayo who called the physicians at Baylor and checked in on him before I could fly there. And, you know, you just don't, I'm really in a privileged situation and patients, it's hard sometimes to figure out where do you find the right expert? Who is the person who knows the most about this valve or who knows the most about this type of cancer or who knows the most current studies that are going on? for, you know, rheumatologic disorders or whatever. And it's really hard to find those. But I think the beauty of Mayo Clinic is that people come for an appointment and then they have this network because we pick up the phone and we call somebody and say, I'm seeing this person, but I don't really think they're right to see me. I actually think maybe they have a neurologic problem. And could you help me with that? And we connect them with somebody else. And so it's it's really a, it's a fascinating way to practice medicine because we're all connected. We do not work on any kind of um, commission or, you know, there's no difference in pay, whether, um, you know, the cardiac surgeon puts a valve in your heart or he doesn't, um, or whether the spine surgeon does a surgery or they don't. And so we're not honestly as motivated by money as um, some private practice physicians have to be because um, medicine is a business. Um, But it's just a, it's a beautiful way to practice medicine. And I think it works really well for patients too. And I'm glad to hear your story. Oh, thank you. And, and I'll tell you what, the, the whole reason I, I know Tracy is because my mother wrote a, a letter to her, to Dr. Schaff's office um, around a year 
I, I'm not trying to put my mom on blast, but uh, if you reach out to Tracy, she'll she'll share it with you. Um, you should check that out. But um, yeah. it's it's uh, you, you're absolutely right um, about that that motivation and the transparency, and I think that's important for people to hear. And you know, I'm a you know I'm a middle class dude, you know, who's who's uh, I'm in the the art world, but I'm also you know I work a nine to five job with a lot of working class guys, hardworking blue collar men, and you know there's a big there's a big spectrum of of what's discussed when it comes to COVID, and where to get accurate information. And we just had a had a had a friend on the show uh, just this week that that came out and and we were saying how you know it'd be nice if you could just turn on the news and and get a straight answer because right. everything's become yeah. so politically slanted one way or the other. And that's right. one of been the, the the another pillar of this podcast is we don't get into that. And because again, there's so many other places for you to get that. And I think that's partially why people have, you know, j- joined us on the, on this cosmic journey that we're on because we're, we're keeping our, our, our chins up and our eyes focused on the prize. And people want to hear something else once in a while too, that right. life oh, yeah. goes on in spite right. of COVID. Absolutely. Right. And, and, you know, talking to you now, you know, my, 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 I had some questions ahead of time and, you know, I've kind of changed my question a little bit that I had in before. And, you know, out here in the, in the world, right. The working world in my, in my world, it feels like COVID's over, right. Because everybody's back at work in my company, it's a transportation company and um, you know, everyone's doing their thing. And I say, I, I commute into work every day. I see a lot of people going over the bridge you know, when I go to the grocery store, it seems like the same amount of people that were going to the grocery store when I was going before. People are wearing their masks, doing their thing. And then you have, um, you know, what I kind of would refer to as kind of a bubble of people that are maybe in metropolitan areas that are that were more heavily affected and people maybe in academia or medicine that are looking at this situation like the professional academics and trained professionals that they are. And, you know, I called Daryl today and I said, you know, I was trying to put together an analogy and I, and I think I finally worked it out. If you, if you ask a contractor to build a birdhouse, contractor is going to have a very meticulous, overly engineered design and execution of what a birdhouse is. If you ask me to build a birdhouse, I'm going to go up to Home Depot. I'm going to get a birdhouse kit. I'm going to waterproof it, I might paint it, and I'm going to put it up. It's two very different methodologies there. You know, there's 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 someone who's an expert and they're like, I'm a craftsman. This is what I do. If you're asking me to solve this problem, this is how I solve it. And then there's me who's a jack of all trades who goes, well, I can solve that problem, but I'm not going to do it. It's not going to have individual shingles and a gutter system. You know what I mean? <laughs> there's no plumbing. Um, and I feel like that's kind of what COVID has become in a nutshell. And there's this competing force for attention, which equals money, you know, uh, all these, all these programs, you know, when they're, and we'll tell you right after the break and then you see, uh, you know, commercial for this and commercial for that. Like, that's what it's about, you know, like they're, they're, they're making money off this. They're not. And that's what, when you hear the Mayo Clinic podcast, you guys aren't, it's not like you're charging people. Mm -mm. It's out there for the open. So, what do you, how, as someone who's in that bubble and don't take, and I'm not saying it's a negative thing, just saying there's a, a clear difference in experience with what, what there is, right? As somebody who's in that universe and you're looking out and you're like, man, how, like, are you, are you and your colleagues all aware that there's that divide or is it, or, yeah, or is the perception like, no, everybody, everybody gets it. No, I think absolutely. But I do, I agree, Justin, that I think a little bit, you know, the world is is trying to move on. People are trying to move on. You know, we call it COVID fatigue or whatever. People are tired of not being able to go anywhere and not being able to hug their relatives and not being able to, you know, go to work or or go get necessities from the store or whatever it is. Um, And so I think that they're, that's natural and that people want to do as much as they can within the bounds of, <laughs> of what, what is allowable. And I think probably more like six months ago to eight months ago, we were really concerned in the medical community about our own staff. Like, you know, Mayo Clinic, we're, we're in a town of 100,000 people in Rochester, Minnesota. It's a small 
community. And 50,000 of those people work for the Mayo Clinic. And so our staff were out and about and, you know, not following the rules and not, and we were really worried because people were getting sick and our, we had to have our staff members at work to take care of patients and they were spreading, you know, COVID through social interactions uh, in the lunchrooms, even at times. And so we really had to, you know, educate people that this, you, you got to stop. We have to do this the right way. And thankfully people respond because they, they trusted the place that they work for. They trusted us in the community. Um, there are areas, I mean, look at Texas. They've now basically almost dismantled everything uh, as far as masking, et cetera. That's a bad idea, I think. And I think we're gonna find out it's a bad idea. Thankfully, more and more people are being vaccinated and that's really gonna help as we move toward a much higher percentage of the population being vaccinated, but there's still all these variants out there and we don't really know what to expect from those yet. COVID has been amazing and the knowledge that we have gained, I, it is astounding. There has been no period in time in human history when science has exploded and expanded like at this rate and we're, humanity has responded. I mean, the change in life that we've experienced in the, in the quick um, ways that people have been able to respond has been astounding, I think. But um, there's still a lot more to be learned. We just don't know enough yet. And so I do think that trying to get back to life is natural and normal and desirable because, you know, you worry about how people are growing up, being told not to hug anybody, never seeing people's faces. I mean, right. weird, what are the, right? not going to school. Right. What are the yeah. long-term effects that we're not, yeah. Right. Yeah. Th that are going to pop up in the future? Yeah. And but there I, has to be some reasonable. So it's a balance. I think it's a balancing act. Yeah, I think so. And it's, I don't know, it's frustrating for me to see you know, I have friends whose businesses, you know, oh. were lost. And um, there are things in life that are ir irreplaceable that you can lose that are not your life. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about Texas, and I'm not speaking for, for the Republic of Texas here by any means. Um, but I, I from from my perspective, I think there's a difference between allowing uh, telling someone they can't do something. Yes. versus allowing someone to make a, a decision for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think at a certain point, and this is just me spitballing here, feel free to tell me I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> I think, I think, you know, if you have, um, like you said, the science is exploding, we have an understanding of how to treat it better now, clearly, somehow, I don't, I'm assuming, because it seems like people are recovering. Obviously, people are dying. Obviously, people are getting very sick. And we now know there's not so much a rhyme or reason and that, you know, there's 20 year olds, there's 10 year olds, there's 80 year olds, you know, then there's all there's then there's 92 year olds that get it. And they're like, Yeah, what are you talking about? You know, they're fine. So there's this wide spectrum of, of outcomes. And if you have a, a medical understanding and, and facilities in place to, to handle it, and you feel confident that you can handle it in the volume, then I, I kind of understand why they're saying, you know what, I'm not telling you don't wear a mask. I'm not telling you to go have a barbecue or a party. I'm just saying I'm not going to have a law that puts you, you know, mm -hmm. at financial risk or puts you in jail because, you know, um, sometimes like, you know, hell is, is paved to paved with good intentions, you know, and something can start out like we got to we got to, you know, two weeks to flatten the curve. And I used to always say to my mother, like, when I was sick, like what a difference a year makes. Like when I was coming out of my surgery, it was like, hey, whatever difference a year makes now I'm doing this. And like, here we are, it's March 17th, uh, you know, St. Patrick's day having this, this podcast. And a year ago yesterday, I was being told, uh, you're laid off. And it was like, huh? Because like five days ago I was at a bar full of people and we were all having a good time. And it's funny, like what a difference a year makes here we are whole new kind of perspective on it in some regards. And now we're having this conversation, you know, with Dr. Gazelka from the Mayo Clinic Q&A podcast about from a whole different, it's almost like we're at, I don't want to say we're at the top of the mountain, but it, it feels like that because now we have so much, we've got a, a you know, more understanding of it. I mean, is that? No, you, I, I that? agree with you, Justin. I think, I mean, my heart goes out. What a devastating, devastating. We haven't even begun, I don't think to, and I'm no sort of a financial person or government person, but when I look at these trillion dollar things, I, my mind can't even conceive right. of what that yeah. means to, to us or to our economy in the future and to people, just individuals, it's people 
who've lost their jobs and their homes and their livelihoods. And it's just absolutely, utterly devastating. And of course, in the United States, we highly value autonomy and our personal rights, essentially, to make decisions for ourselves. And so in that way, we probably respond a little differently um, to uh, restrictions yes. than some of the European countries, perhaps, where, you know, the or, or other countries where the government can prescribe things a little bit more freely or uh, more accepted by the by the populace, maybe. Um, and so I, I hear what you're saying completely. I do think that um, there has to be a reasonable balance. We know that you know, we know that masking works. The studies show that no matter right. what everybody says on the internet. Um, now, what about the two mask thing? W what's the deal with that? Because all of a sudden, and again, now this is just from, this is just from where I'm sitting because I remember, it's funny, last January, I was at this giant music convention in, in Southern California. Then we went to Disneyland and we're, in a, you know, a million people there. And then we came home and it was like, everything started to fall to shit. And at first it was like, you don't need a mask, save right. those. Then it was like the yeah. conversation of you like, do you need a mask? Do you need a mask? Yeah. We don't need a mask. You have to have a mask. Need... Right. And like, <laughs> you know, everybody has their own anecdotal experience with, with masks and whether or not they got COVID. That's, that's for everybody to deal with. But what I'm saying is the messaging has not been clear. And I don't think, yes. and again, I don't want to get political, but I don't think it's, I don't think you can blame that on one person's shoulders that no. the messaging was not clear and that certain outlets ran with things that they knew weren't true. And then the CDC put something out on a Friday at four o'clock, uh, you know, a press release and surprise, surprise, nobody sees it. And one of the big ones that I can think of is like surfaces. How many people were scared to death that they were yeah. bleaching their groceries before they came in or still doing it. And yeah. it's like, guys, it turns yeah. out, and I don't, you know, I'm not going to say it, but turns out just go to the CDC website for yourself and read about it. And you go, oh, okay. Now I feel a little bit better about going to the grocery store. Or, you know, you don't, maybe you don't need to wear rubber gloves to handle your groceries, you know, like oh my gosh. there were people I've seen it, you know, I know. Yeah. And, and it's, and it, I think, like you said, there's this financial cost that's going to come. There's a social cost, you know, like I think about uh, birthdays, right? I'm going to go on a limb here and say nobody's blowing out birthday candles ever again. Because when you look at it now, it's like, wow, this is stupid. This whole people time, are on the cake. this whole time, my whole idea of a celebration is getting all the people I love in a one room and then I'm going to spit on something and then I'm going to feed it to them. You know, <laughs> yeah. like when you, when you break it down, it's like, well, this was, this was dumb. This was a bad idea. So there's going to be little things that don't go away. I do think, however, you know, I will be shaking hands. I think that's ridiculous. Um, that's just my personal opinion. Um, so where do you see, you know, where do you see your role kind of in, in getting out that information? Because I think it's neat that like podcasting in general as a platform is so, so cool because you got that direct, it goes right to people's phones. Every time a new episode comes out, right, it's right, yep. right to your phone. And like, yep. I can, if, if we wanted to, we could record this and literally put it out the second we're done and it, it could go straight out to the internet. And we've never had that kind of power before um, from, a, you know, everything's centralized with these big networks, you know, and now everybody's on the same playing field. So if you are somebody like me, who's like, okay, well, you know what, I don't trust this news source. I don't trust this news source, but I do trust the Mayo Clinic. I'll listen to what they have to say about it. I'm not gonna listen to what this clown has to say, but I'll listen to them. And I think that's like everyone is and it's tribal, right? So it's not ultimately, it's not the best thing, I guess. But I think we're kind of starting to turn to that because you, you said something about Rochester's a small community. And the word community, I think, is is something that's being rediscovered mm -hmm. in these times because there's a generation of people like myself who didn't really interact with their neighbors because right. they just didn't you don't talk to them. And now because of all this, you know, my fiance and I were new, relatively new homeowners. Like you started to see the value in like, who are the, pe the five people that we live next to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you talk about like, it's important so we can serve our community and be healthy, but also the people coming to us. And I think the, you're going to see that pillar pop up in every community out of necessity. So whether it's, 
you know, a local newspaper or a local church or a podcast or whatever, um, people are starting to divert where they get their information from. And, you know, I'm curious how, like, do you ever think about what you're doing, the reach that you have as a podcast host versus what you're doing, only interacting with one patient at a time? Yeah, you said a couple of things that really struck me. And one of them um, is this rapid um, sharing of information. I think one of the most frustrating things being on the leadership team at Mayo that we experienced is that one day, literally, we're telling people, don't use the masks. We got to save those for people. And if you use a mask, you need to wear that paper, little thin surgical mask which we would typically change in between every patient room. You'd walk into a new OR, take that, before you go in the OR, take that old mask off, throw it away, put a new one on. You do that 12 times a day or more. And wow. then, no, you gotta save that one for a week and make sure that it's really worn out and dirty before, before we recycle it <laughs> <laughs> and, and reclean those. But that was just out of necessity. And then we learned, well, we all need to be masking. And so I think that the information that we had and the understanding was changing so rapidly that that was both a good thing because we could relay information quickly in podcast form on the news, in the media, et cetera, in trusted sources like Mayo Clinic. But um, also it's scary for people. There's a lot of fear mongering that goes with that. Well, you're changing things so quickly. I mean, think about when I was a kid, there were no cell phones or computers. And so it would have taken forever for the newspaper to get information from Minneapolis, probably about anything. It would have been months before we knew anything had changed. And so there are advantages and disadvantages, but I think, um, I always try to look for the silver lining. And I think some of the silver linings of COVID are this ability to convey and to rapidly change when we need to, and to say we're wrong when we need to, and we need to go back and do that differently. But I also, the, the other thing you mentioned was this change in priorities that I think has been extraordinary for people during COVID. You know, we're, uh, we're so rapid paced all of the time and busy on our phones and our social media. And I think that's probably worse somewhat during COVID because that's where people are. They're stuck in their homes looking at their social media, but they also are thinking about what's really important to them in life. Um, do, do I want to spend my time, you know, on this activity or should I stick closer to home and, you know, clean out all my closets and focus on my kids and my, my family, et cetera. So I think there's just been extraordinary difficulties, um, but also incredible blessings that have come with this as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know I spent more time outside last year, yeah. you know, than, than I had ever in my entire life. Combined. There were no gyms to go to. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, yeah. I'll tell you one thing that, that isolation that I know we all kind of like talk about with respect to COVID is and that blessings that you just mentioned, Dr. Kazalka is that the isolation and being away from that, you don't have the touch, you don't have the shaking hands that you'd like to have brother Jay. I like, Hey, you know, it's just not there, not consistently the way we, we had it before when everything was quote unquote normal. Right. Um, that isolation kind of, it, it, it's yielded a sense of community. Like you said, Brother Jay, hey, who are my neighbors? Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Gazelka, I'm pretty sure you, you've, you've had that, that something mm -hmm. similar to that effect as well. And then also the isolation has gotten me to think about all the people that I haven't kept in contact with the, yeah. the, the, you know, wh whether it's relatives, whether it's friends, you know, the ones you say, Hey, I'll always text in the back because you have that, that's that, that social media at your fingertips or the cell phone. You're like, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. You never did it. And now we're in a point where I, when I'm like, I'm, I'm annoying people now. Cause I'm just calling everybody. And I'm just saying, <laughs> Hey man, how you doing? Hey, you just talked to me yesterday, DC. Come on, man. I'm like, Hey, but I just want to say, I love you. And hey, COVID, <laughs> and I can't wait till this thing comes is normal. And then we can like hug and be great. So it's just like, you know, see, that's why Daryl and I get along so well together. As you can tell, I'm a talker and Daryl and I will just, will talk incessantly forever yeah. to each other. It's, it's, it's really amazing. And then we'll get on and do a podcast, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's, to say you have an unlimited capacity to do that now that you can just put it out there absolutely, <laughs> it absolutely. Is, it's really cool and, and and i've you know i've said this before you know um the it's amazing to look at the data and see the international audience and like that people are getting this in india and pakistan <laughs> and like you know panama and just it's, it blows your mind You're like what could you possibly be 
you know, relating yeah. to, but, but some, some there, you know, it, it, the, the information finds a way and cosmic, and I'm sure yeah. it's a, it's a similar thing with the, with the Mayo Clinic uh, Q and a podcast there. So what, in your opinion is the most important takeaway that you've had from one of your guests on the Mayo Clinic Q and a podcast. Most important takeaway. Hmm. I think, um, be grateful. Uh, you know, I, I told you, I like silver linings and I think, um, no matter where we are, at least my sense of it is there's often someone who's worse off than we are. And if we're looking for them and trying to meet them where they are and be a blessing to them, it's probably going to help us to manage some of what's going on with us as well. And I think that flexibility and the ability to, you know, change have been really positive personality traits for people during COVID because there's been so much need for change and it's pushed us all probably a little bit oh, past yeah. our comfort zones. Absolutely. And I think that's a good thing to stretch in a way as human beings, but um, just to, to remember that what's most important is, is other people. And um, if you live your life that way, I don't think that you'll ever um, regret it. Well said. And, and I've got, Dr. Kuzalka, I've got one more question for you. And I'm going to put you on the spot. And I am going to be asking your professional opinion here as a medical professional. So, so please mm -hmm. take it. Hey, to, I'm preparing myself. It it's okay. coming. <laughs> what kind of health risks do you think may or may not be involved with, say, an adult male consuming, I don't know, 14 cans of Mountain Dew? <clears throat> 16. 16. In, one, <laughs> in one sitting. <laughs> Do you, think 18, that's any, 18. do you think that's anything we should be worried about? <laughs> 18. Oh boy, you you must have listened. You better listen to some of our uh, cancer podcasts where we talk about well-being, sugar, that much sugar. Is it diet Mountain Dew? No. <laughs> <laughs> Right from the source. Even, even <laughs> if it is, what's in those chemicals? Uh, you probably don't want to know. Yeah, that's, that's Zyklon B or something. Sugar. That's bad. let me be honest. Too much, now, what too if much you're? Sugar what if you? Calories. But what if you're in the body of a super athlete and you're a former NFL player and you can just, is there any, any, we're not naming you? names. It's no one on no, this no, podcast. No, 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 no. This is, I know this is for a friend. It's for, for a friend. friend. It's yeah, about yeah. six, four. Yeah. Um, is yeah. there any way possible that <laughs> very handsome man, burns very, <laughs> very fast, handsome man. I'm yes. going to guess that that amazing athletic individual has probably recognized <laughs> that as we age, we all become susceptible to certain things and we don't want to, we don't want to um, right. rapidly accelerate that any more than we have to by drinking too much sugar and too much taper that. We might all want to taper down the Mountain Dew. Oh, you're, so anyway. <laughs> you're saying there's a chance. You're saying. So you're saying there's a chance. I got well, it. I'm not hearing no. I'm, I'm not surprised hearing no. that it's Mountain Dew. You know, we hear about everybody's drinking so much alcohol during COVID that oh, I well. think that's a yeah. that's a serious everybody, health concern everybody's, too. Everybody's got their, uh, you know. I, I got I got one question too, and it and yeah. it's only because we're kindred spirits. So you don't even know it. So, uh, there was there was an article by Ann Murphy on postbulletin.com, and it, you were very eloquent in that article. Oh. You, you, you dropped. I'm never gonna live that down. Um, look, you, you dropped all these 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 just nuclear warheads of information to people, and then toward the end of it, you, you talk about, hey, you know what? I'm not as boring as all that sounds. There is way more to me than that. And you mentioned you loving summers and flowers and hiking and moto jackets and your favorite colors, orange, pink, bright, vibrant, Whoa, you, blue, you good. You really black. Read this article. And I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat reading this article. I'm just like, she doesn't even know. <laughs> Those are like my favorite colors. Well, you know what? There are, there, there are some times where pink is actually a good thing. But I Powerful. love orange. I love blue. I mean, orange and blue. And then yes, and, yes. and then and then you hit the, the black and the moto jacket and then summer. Par you love flowers. My favorite my favorite flower is the birds <laughs> of paradise flower. It's from oh, South lovely. Africa. Yes. It is beautiful. It is gorgeous. And, and I colors. was like, it's just right, right, like unbelievable. So I'm like, I cannot wait to jump all on this. I like Gerber daisies. I like a lot of flowers. Oh my gosh. Love, I love, love it. Love it. See? <laughs> mm, yes. He's deep. Sorry, I'm sorry. You, I just deep. I just had to had to I am never gonna out. live that down, but I'm glad that I'm glad that you enjoyed that. 
it was an it was i thought it was great i mean i don't know to all of our every man and every woman it was an you should go to postbulletin.com and check out that article you should do it well dr gazelka <laughs> this has been absolutely fantastic Again, uh, you know, Mayo Clinic Q&A podcast available on all platforms uh, multiple times a week, and it's on YouTube. Thank you so much for doing this. I hope we get to do this again soon. Have you back here in the Cosmic Thanks, you guys. I have loved being here. Thank you for having me here. It's been a lot of fun for me. Um, I kind of like that little Post Bulletin article. It was a taste of, I like to get outside of medicine sometimes. It's a good thing. We don't want to be too stuffy. And Justin, we can't wait to have you come to the Mayo Clinic Q&A podcast and talk about your experience. I'm excited about it. We'll see you then.